Well, welcome back to another episode of Parker's Pensies. This is a podcast where we explore thoughts in philosophy, theology, nature, and life. I love thinking about cool stuff, so come think with me. Today is a very special episode. I'm a little bit nervous for it. We got two uh, giants. Uh, we have Thomas Crisp and Tyler McNabb, doctors, the both of them, and we're going to be talking about the evolutionary argument against naturalism and different variations of it. Um, so I am, I'm a little bit nervous. We have a metaphysician, we have an epistemologist, all we're missing is like an axiologist or an ethicist or something. Um, so I'm, I'm, I guess I'll try and fill in there, but, um, no promises. So let's just pull these guys in, uh, Tyler and, and, uh, Tom, I don't know what to call you guys. Is that cool? If I call you guys by your first names? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. I'm, I'm down here. I recognize you guys are. Yeah. So mm -hmm. no, no worries there. Um, mm -hmm. so I'm really excited about this argument. I I came into it uh, from reading C.S. Lewis, getting introduced to the argument from reason, and then I kind of discovered some Planninga, and I thought, you know, Planninga is just ripping off Lewis, and he gave him a footnote in, in Warren and Proper Function, but blah, blah. And I, as I read uh, Planninga more and Lewis, I realized these are two separate arguments, so they're both kind of related, and uh, they, can, they can both be traced all the way back to James Balfour and maybe before that. Um, I wanted to ask you guys, how did you first come across the evolutionary argument from naturalism? Uh, Dr. Or Tom, can we start with you? Yeah. Um, I guess I first came across it in Warrant and Proper Function. I think that was the first published version of it. Or at any rate, that was the first published version of it mm -hmm. that I had seen. And then I was a grad student um, and studied uh, with Planning at Notre Dame and uh, took a seminar on his book, Warranted Christian Belief, before it was published. And um, uh, he discussed his argument there, too. And um, um, so this is where I first came across it. Is, am, I, am I remembering that right, Tyler? Is, does it first show up in Warranted Proper Function or first show up in Warranted Christian Belief? Uh, Warranted Proper Function, toward the end uh -huh. of it. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, Tyler. So, so you're uh, you're notoriously a a Plantingian. Did you did you come to evolutionary argument before uh, proper function or proper function first and then discovered? Yeah. So I actually um, used to like a, an argument from reason uh, that was developed by um, Greg Bonson back in my presuppositionalist days. And uh, when I heard about the evolutionary argument against naturalism, I was like, oh, this is kind of similar except it seems like it's more widely um, talked about and perhaps it, it, it's more of a threat, so to speak. And so uh, I started getting, I remember buying the Naturalism Defeated volume and going through all those essays. And uh, uh, yeah, that, that's kind of, so I actually was interested in the uh, evolutionary argument against naturalism before I was interested in reformed epistemology. Okay. Yeah, well, so some of us long for the days uh, of your return back to presuppositionalism. We we patiently await. Uh, probably not going to happen, but we'll see. Um, so I've I've come to to learn in philosophy and particularly philosophy of religion that you you can't say the anymore. You can't say the evolutionary argument from natural. There's like it's always a family of belief. It's always a family of the problem of evil or this or that. And uh, from from reading some of your, both of your guys' works, I've seen that, yeah, they can be formulated different ways. And reading uh, like George Mavrodes, I've seen that, yeah, there's a person relativity to different proofs. Um, I, I see it as kind of a, a negative transcendental argument against naturalism. Uh, Tyler, you've, you kind of came out of uh, presup. Do you, do you see it that way? Or what, what kind of argument is this? Um, yeah, I mean, I suppose you could develop it into something like a transcendental argument where you say, well, here are the preconditions uh, uh, of knowledge um, rest in a theistic worldview where you know, only a theistic worldview can supply the preconditions to make knowledge intelligible. I, I suppose you can go that route. Okay. You can also give it like an argument for proper function, right? That's right. similar to, to that. But I, I don't see this primarily as a transcendental argument. Um, I see it as, as uh, an, sort of just primarily an epistemic argument that, mm -hmm shows that uh, reflective naturalists have a defeater for trusting their cognitive faculties and whether it be um, full stop cognitive faculties or whether it be their complex abductive processes as uh, Tom Crisp has uh, really um, uh, eloquently put. Um, so yeah, I guess that's, that's kind of 
how I would see things. Okay. Yeah. And, and Tom, something that's really interesting about you is that you are a, you're a metaphysician and your book here, Metaphysics, was super helpful for me. I was working on a, mm. trying to work on an argument from facts and it was really hard to find anyone dealing with facts. Like mm. just what are they? And so this yeah. book uh, by you and Michael Lux, uh, or is it Lowe? Is it Michael Lowe? Lux. 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 It is Lux. It okay. Lux. Uh, it was super duper, duper helpful. You guys had just a few pages on facts, but even those pages were Super duper helpful. So I appreciate that. Also, I, I want to hawk. You can hawk Taylor's book, uh, Tyler's book here, Religious Epistemology, Debating Christian Religion. So we got books for days. Uh, if you guys like these guys, go buy all their books. Um, Dr. Chris, you, you, uh, Tom, you are a metaphysician, and yet you've developed a really like what many people say is the best form of this epistemological argument. Uh, are you are you like playing in someone else's sandbox? How'd you? How did you come to develop this great epistemological argument as a metaphysician? <laughs> well, I, I I didn't know. I, I have to say, I've kind of been out of this area for a while. I wrote these papers a while back and haven't haven't written much on them or kept up. So I didn't know anybody was reading these papers of mine. You, you wrote me an email and said so you talked to <laughs> folks who th thought this was a good argument. I and my, my first response is I, I didn't know anybody was reading it or had any interest in it. So. Um, am I playing in someone else's sandbox? I, I don't know, maybe a little bit, but I, I have published papers in epistemology and my um, my interests for a long time were both meta in, in metaphysics and epistemology. So yeah, so I, I, I've worked in epistemology and and um, on on Al's epistemology, um, uh, 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 planning his epistemology. I've, I've I've spent quite a lot of time thinking about it. So mm -hmm. it's something that's definitely an area of interest. Yeah, that's so awesome. Uh, so for those who can't see, because we have three people up, we have Alvin planning a, as our background here, making a, a funny face. Uh, uh, a question for, for both of you guys, uh, whoever wants to jump in first, do you have to be, do you have to hold a proper functionalism to employ or, or to use the evolutionary argument from naturalism, against naturalism? Or can you be like an internalist and also use it or some other form of epistemology, uh, externalism or whatever? Uh, do, you, do you have to be a Plantingian to, to use this argument? Well, I'll, I'll give my take on it, and then Tyler, I, I suspect I know what you'd, you'll say. But no, the, the argument doesn't presuppose any particular theory of warrant or justification. Um, it requires um, um, commitment to the plausibility of certain defeat principles. But you could you can think that the defeat principles operative in these arguments plausible on any number of different mm -hmm. um, basic epistemologies on any on any number of theories of warrant or justification. So, so I think you don't need to hold the planning of epistemology to find this kind of argument. Okay. Powerful. Yeah, I, I think if you're a process reliabilist or if you endorse phenomenal conservatism, I, uh, I, I don't see what um, tenet that's affirmed uh, in, in, in these sorts of uh, epistemic theories would uh, entail a rejection or would show incompatibility with the evolutionary being its naturalism. Um, I, 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 I hear that sometimes. Um, yeah. that, that that's the case, that, that it, it doesn't work unless you're already a committed hard externalist or something like that, um, or specifically a proper functionalist. But I'm, I'm not sure exactly why that claim is made. It, I have never really understood it. Um, but uh, and real quick, just to comment on something, uh, Tom, in reference to your, your paper, uh, especially the one that was in the Blackwell Companion to Naturalism, uh, um, among all my friends, uh, whenever we talk about the best versions of the argument, it's always your paper. Really? So, so j just to well. let you know, your paper definitely is uh, uh, held in high regard with with a lot of people. So, okay. just thought I'd throw that out there. That's good. Yeah, that's awesome. And and likewise, I mean, I've heard it from Tyler, but I've heard it from other people as well. Which is, uh, oh, uh, yeah. Um, Nate Lawfer, by the way, uh, one of your one of your former students. He's sure. he's he's also said that I just talked with him the other day, and we were talking about you. So he says hi. Um, I just yeah, got an email from him. I yeah, he's a great dude. He's he's been helping me think through a lot of that. He's an internalist, so he's always poking holes in everything I want to believe. But it's a, <laughs> it's a good conversation. Um, actually, Tom, real quick, are are you uh, you internalist, externalist? You got some kind of commitment there. I'm an externalist. Yeah. I I hold some version or other of proper functionalism. Um, so I, I, some kind of 
uh, I'm some kind of evidentialist qua proper functionalist. Uh, mm. And I've got a line about how those fit together. Um, but um, the 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 proper functionalist part of me makes me an externalist. So, okay. so I am externalist. Yeah. I hope Tyler didn't get too triggered by that. The, uh, <laughs> uh, no, I was just going to ask, is the evidentialism like contingent upon the design plan or is it like evidentialism simplicator, like a necessary truth? Well, no, it's contingent on the design plan. So the thought is something like um, belief is justified insofar as it's um, – grounded in um, um, evidence, but what is it that explains the, the justificatory power of, of our evidence? And that's gonna be mediated by proper function. Yeah. That's something, so a given experience warrants a certain kind of perceptual belief, why? Right. And, and I think that's, well, it's proper function and it could right. be different as, as Reed speculates. Very good, yeah. Awesome. No, so, no, no triggering needed. No triggering good. needed. <laughs> <laughs> so um, for, for the listeners, we're talking about uh, generally right now, we're talking about planning as epistemology, proper functionalism, also reformed epistemology. Um, and that is that there's a, uh, it's an externalist theory of knowledge because the, um, well, I'll let these guys explain, but you have uh, it's, it's basically you have, a, you've been designed to reason in this cognitive environment in which you're placed and your cognitive faculties are generally reliable and they're aimed at truth. And so here, here's kind of where uh, planning as argument kind of flourishes. And I, I've seen it as a way to kick the naturalists off of proper functionalism, because if you just have proper functionalism, then you have kind of Pandora's box, which Tyler, you've written about, of people saying, well, we're all warranted in all of our beliefs. And I kind of saw it as a way for planning and to say, yeah, you can kind of come over here. Oh, wait, here's this argument to kick you off of my off my platform. What do you guys think about that? Is that is that what planning was intending? Are, are you talking about um, the idea that uh, proper function seems like this kind of neutral view, um, like various naturals hold to like Peter Graham, Ruth mm -hmm. Milligan, I think uh, Ernest Sosa is very close to it. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's kind of like, hey guys, everyone can come on my ship. But then planning is like, but actually, you have to have an intelligent designer to make sense of proper function. Is, is that what you're talking that's, about? That's, that's how I've read it. That's that's what I've seen. Yeah. Um, what, what do you think about that? Yeah, and I, I, it, it kind of does seem like that, where he's like, hey, either God or evolution or both. But then you get to like uh, the end of one proper function, or you get to his debate with M Michael Tooley, uh, the knowledge of God. And he's very adamant that it's like, nope, mm -hmm. <laughs> naturalistic accounts don't work. They're neither necessary nor sufficient. And he gives various reasons why. Um, so, yeah. Uh, so I, I, I take this to be a different, though, distinct from the evolutionary argument against naturalism. So mm -hmm. for this to be effective, you'd have to argue for the truth of proper functionalism. Yeah. So uh, I don't know. Maybe you'd give various swamp man uh, arguments for proper function as, as what I my favorite thing to do. Mm -hmm. um, and then you would convince them of a proper function, and then and then you would then need to to show them that proper function requires uh, an intelligent mind behind it. Um, you would show them that the naturalistic accounts, whether it be history or natural selection, et cetera, they don't work. Um, so anyway, so I, I would see this as a distinct. So you yeah. can kind of combine these two, where it's like here's an argument for proper function, here's the evolutionary argument against naturalism. Now you have a lot to think about, but I do see them as independent arguments. Yeah, that's great. That's great. Uh, and, so, and yeah, Parker, please, if I could just add, please, please, that, please. That, that's sort of how it worked in in planning this project. There, there were sort of two separate ways of showing that uh, there's there's pressure toward theism and 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 a problem for naturalism. On the one hand, there's all these reasons for thinking that the best sort of epistemology is proper functionalism. Uh, and then, and then there's the argument that the only way you can make sense of that is in a theistic framework. Um, and then on the other, on a separate point, there's the evolutionary argument, which, which suggests that that you need a theistic framework to make sense of um, our ability to to know. Um, and so we have sort of two separate reasons then for yeah. for thinking naturalism's in trouble. That's that's deadly. I love that. Uh, so I'll, I'll kick it to, to Tom real quick, and we'll go back to Tyler. Tom, uh, can you de can you define naturalism for us? What are we talking about when we say naturalism? Uh, well, that turns out to be a vexed question, there, and there's a lot of dispute in the literature about exactly how to think about it. The way that that Plante always would would characterize it is naturalism is the view that there's no God or any being like God, 
And so the, the, it's not atheism. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a stronger claim than atheism because you, you might be an atheist, think there's no God of, of, of the sort that classical theism uh, um, subscribes to. Um, but you might think, nevertheless, there's the platonic good or, mm -hmm. or that there's uh, some sort of uh, world soul a la... Um, 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 oh, uh, I'm, I'm blanking on... Um, <laughs> on the on the world soul uh you think of chalmers uh, maybe or no 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 um like online and, <laughs> no no the, the the historic uh um uh, panpsychism or pan pantheism it'll come to me a second you'll, you'll laugh <laughs> when i um, um but at any rate it, you might believe in things like world souls or 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 things like the platonic good um uh, and and therefore be an atheist but mm -hmm. but um uh, naturalism is the view that there's nothing like those things. Uh, so there's just sort of particles and fields of force and that's it. Hmm. Uh, that's how planning it ordinarily would talk about it. And I think that's a perfectly fine way of thinking about it. Okay. Yeah, that's really helpful. Uh, Tyler, if you have anything to add uh, on naturalism, please. But uh, if not, then <laughs> or, did you actually? Uh, no, I was just going to say, I like Michael uh, Bergman's uh definition which is like no god no souls no ghosts <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah simple so, yeah it, it's it's a, a very hard thing to define uh, yeah so yeah, I, I i would just go with something simple like that probably that's great that's why i asked you guys and i didn't try to define it myself um because it's notoriously difficult and people write books and books and books on it uh tyler so uh one of the one of the cool things about this episode is that uh tom's tom's argument is unique uh, it's a particular type of, of evolutionary argument against naturalism, whether it fits or not, we can talk, but, um, can you just kind of lay out like the general family resemblance of evolutionary arguments for us? And then we can jump off from there into Tom's particular view. Yeah. So, um, I guess the, the, the key, th one of the key things at least is that there's this idea that if you hold to naturalism and evolution together, uh, in conjunction together, then upon reflecting on the implications of that, you're going to have a defeater for trusting your your cognitive faculties. And so, as I understand it, at least, um, organisms have certain mutations. Uh, most of these mutations are not advantageous for the organisms and it, its survival. However, on occasion, a mutation could occur that does aid the, the organism to uh, be better off in surviving. Um, uh, and you have enough of these mutations, right? You're, you're going to ultimately get a new organism. And uh, the, you know, ultimately sort of uh, the, the purpose, if we can call it that, of our faculties is to uh, get our body parts in the right place at the right time. So this is Patricia Churchland's famous four Fs, right? They're for fighting, fe fleeting, feeding, and reproducing. Yeah. And so, uh, yeah, but upon reflection of this, upon reflection that, uh, our faculties aren't directly aimed at truth, um, then um, uh, why, why, why should we trust our cognitive faculties? Uh, if, if they're sort of there and kept for the purposes of survival and reproduction, then it seems like we, we shouldn't trust our faculties. We'd have a defeater for trusting our faculties and including a defeater for the beliefs they produce, which include the belief in naturalism. So, so something like that is a generic very brief, uh, hard sketch of the argument that I take it. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Thank you. Um, and so the aim kind of, I, I think in the, in the general, like e we have to find a name for it. It's like every other argument you can shorten. This would be like Ian or something. Maybe do, do people call it? What, what do we call this? E, e, e double A N. That's still kind of a mouthful. <laughs> <laughs> so D E double A, -A for Ian, I'm going to say Ian. Sorry, everyone, that that's grading. But so for for Ian, the the general the the target, uh, or the I think the thing doing the work, it's like the the truth directedness, and I think I've heard planning has said that that he it, it isn't a skeptical threat argument, but it, in my mind, maybe he hasn't said that. It seems like a skeptical threat. It's like if you do hold these two, uh, uh, N and E together, then you have skeptical or you have global skepticism, which undercuts n and e is that what do you guys think if about you reflect if you reflect on uh naturalism and evolution these tenets and you you realize that the probability of having reliable cognitive faculties is lower and scrutable 
then then that's where the skepticism is going to come about. And and so if, if you then you're going to have a defeater, and then if you have a defeater, mm-hmm. you're going to have defeater for the beliefs they produce, including the belief in naturalism. And, and so it's it's going is it it's, it's starting with that global route of saying all all the beliefs produced by your cognitive faculties of which N and E are in that set. Does that sound right? Yeah, yeah. the 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 claim is that you you get a reason for thinking that uh, your overall cognitive system is unreliable, mm-hmm. and that then gives you a, a a defeater for any belief produced by that system. And so, for the reflective naturalist who's who's noticed that the the probabilities are low that they would have got cognitive reliability given evolution and naturalism, they get a defeater for any belief they hold, any belief produced by their cognitive faculties. Yeah. Okay, and here's where we get to the the uniqueness of of Tom's view, in that uh, you have limited the scope from the from the global skepticism to just like in, in one paper, uh, one of your papers on uh, what's it called, uh, evolutionary objection to the argument from evil. You limited the scope to just uh, recondite philosophical matters, and then in your Blackwell uh, companion to naturalism paper or uh, chapter, you said metaphysical faculties. And that, that one's a little bit easier. I like I like the recondite philosophical matters, but metaphysical mm-hmm. faculties is a little bit easier. So mm-hmm. if if I'm understanding it right, you've limited from uh, all the, the the a global skeptical threat to just uh, the target is just your metaphysical beliefs, the beliefs produced by the the faculties that produce metaphysical beliefs. Is that is that a fair characterization? Yeah, with just a, a little bit of um, nuance. Uh, yeah. So it, it really was the that faculty which produces in its uh, abstract metaphysical beliefs. Okay. So I so as I was thinking about metaphysics in that paper, metaphysics is actually a a, a very broad enterprise. Mm-hmm. Uh, I suggested that when uh, hunter gatherers use abductive reasoning to um, discern the location of an animal that they're tracking, they're engaged in a kind of metaphysics. Metaphysics, I suggested, is just the attempt to discern the reality in its uh, behind the appearances. And um, but, but abstract metaphysics is the attempt to discern the reality behind the appearances, where the reality that you're attempting to, to study is far removed from the appearances and and you're postulating structures when you're when you're engaged in this kind of metaphysics whose constituents are really different than the objects of everyday life and knowledge of these structures uh would be something far removed from the concerns of everyday life so Mm. string theory would be an example or or the kind of metaphysics we do in philosophy wondering about the nature of universals the nature of time like of that, we're, we're we're postulating structures that, in some sense, underlie the uh, the appearances we we um, in, in inhabit, and those structures are oftentimes um, populated by things that are really different than than the things of everyday life. And knowledge of these structures is um, oftentimes very far removed from the everyday concerns of life. You don't need to know much about these things in order to get around in the world. So that kind of metaphysics. Um, mm-hmm. Uh, abstract metaphysics. It, it was it was our the faculty that enables that. I was thinking about, and that's what I call our metaphysical faculty. Okay, and so so uh, the hunter gatherers can engage in kind of some some metaphysics inference to the best explanation. They're looking at the bunny's tracks, and they're 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 reasoning that way. But then maybe once they get into like, I wonder if this bunny evolves from a lesser life form, or what's the essence of this bunny? And then you're getting in more abstract. Exactly. Okay. Yeah, so they start wondering: uh, Is this bunny a bundle of tropes? Uh, is th- does this bunny uh, uh, persist after death? And they're like, now, now yeah. you're starting to get into abstract metaphysics. Oh, just just real quick, following up on on uh, I brought up facts. Um, would if if you were discussing the facts of the matter, uh, and facts are abstract, then would would that uh, fit in the set of abstract metaphysical beliefs? Well, when you say facts are abstract, do you, you could mean a couple different things by that. You, you might have in mind a metaphysical claim to the effect mm-hmm. that facts are not concrete objects. Yeah. Uh, is, is that is that that's the, that's kind of what I'm thinking? Yeah. No, that that uh, that's abstractness along a different dimension or a different okay. sort of abstractness. Okay. So the kind of abstractness I was thinking about was abstract metaphysics is metaphysics that that deals in recondite 
issues that deals with um, issues that are far removed from the everyday concerns of life, mm -hmm. abstract in that sense. So in, in that kind of metaphysics, we're postulating these structures underlying the appearances. And, but knowledge of these structures is really far removed from the everyday concerns yeah. of life. And, and the things that we're postulating in these structures are, are bizarre kind of um, uh, outre entities that are very different than we see in everyday life. It's mm -hmm. abstract in that sense that I'm yeah. talking about. Okay, that's that's helpful, T Tyler. Uh, do you so do so you like this argument? You've recommended it to me as well. Does this uh, does does this category of abstract metaphysical uh, beliefs and, and the faculties that produce them does this just not fit in the four Fs at all? Like, how, how do we think through that? Yeah, so uh, I think you would need to get into the kind of the basis of the argument where and. Tom will do a much better job at doing this than I would ever do. But um, where uh, the idea is that for abduction, abduction requires imagination. Um, you have to think of like different competing hypotheses uh, that are relevant in order to determine which of the, uh, which, which hypothesis is actually the, the, the best one, which, which hypothesis is true. And, and then obviously you have to, um, uh, so your imagination is quite robust, and the idea is that is, is our imagination uh, is it as robust as it needs to be for thinking about competing hypotheses for these larger scale interpro metaphysical enterprises. And so it just doesn't seem like uh, that we're in the position to make a judgment call whether or not our imagination capacities are tracking in this sort of way. Mm. Uh, on naturalism and evolution. Uh, at least that's how I understand uh, Tom's argument. And uh, what I think is, is interesting, and I'd love to hear Tom's comments on this. Um, uh, so in, in one of my works, I briefly mentioned Tom's argument. And then I say that, that I think it can easily still turn into an, an evolutionary argument against naturalism, not just a argument against naturalistic metaphysics, because if, um, atheism or naturalism is a belief that's derived by these complex abductive faculties. So say you're like getting all the information in regarding the problem of evil, regarding the problem of divine hiddenness, uh, fine tuning, you're taking in fine tuning arguments, you're taking in Kalam cosmological arguments, you know, et cetera. And then you're utilizing this great abductive process. You're, it seems like you're using these uh, abductive processes throughout all of this, and then one final go at it, so to speak. And so it seems like if your if your belief in atheism is the byproduct of your complex abductive faculties, and you have a defeater for our, for these complex abductive faculties at this sort of level, then it seems to me that uh, naturalism or atheism is still self defeating in this way, and it can still be categorized as an evolutionary argument against naturalism. So I'd love to hear Tom's thoughts on this. Yeah, I agree. Um, I didn't frame it like that in this in this paper I was writing um, about naturalistic metaphysics, but but the actually the conclusion of the paper is that our metaphysical faculties uh, are such that um, we have reason to doubt any of their deliverances. And since n naturalism, the next step would be just to point out that naturalism is a deliverance of our metaphysical faculties, and therefore we we, we get a defeater for naturalism. So so yeah, it's a quick move from the argument I run in this paper to the evolutionary argument against naturalism. That's awesome. Tom, can I, uh, can I ask the impetus be behind, uh, behind limiting the scope to abstract metaphysical uh, beliefs? Like uh, I, I think it's really unique. It's really interesting because um, you've, you've worked on metaphysics. So it, it's that kind of mind that would develop this kind of argument, which is really cool. Um, but what, what was the reasoning behind limiting the scope? Like how, how does this help the argument, uh, get off the ground? Yeah. Well, so in the literature on, on planning his argument, uh, Ian is your one to call it, Parker. Um, um, there was quite a bit of pushback to the effect that, um, if our, uh, ancestors had cognitive faculties that were adaptive, then we we should expect uh, them to have co overall cognitive reliability, and this gets into these really, uh, I think, subtle issues about how to understand what beliefs are and understand what truth is. And but but um, at any rate, it's not it's not just obvious that um, um, if our 
uh, ancestors had their uh, faculties produced by the usual evolutionary story, that there would be overall cognitive unreliability. I mean, I buy um, Al's argument, uh, mm -hmm. but but there was a lot of controversy about that part of it. Um, and and I, I don't know exactly what the impetus was, but I, it, it, I started thinking, well, maybe that's right. But um, what would be surprising is if our uh, uh, ancestors um, got cognitive faculties that were reliable with respect to th these really abstract questions, these that far removed from the everyday concerns of life. Um, the, the, the usual story is that um, uh, um, our cognitive faculties are about the same in terms of uh, structure and capability as were our evolutionary ancestors um, in the Pleistocene era, uh, somewhere between, I forget the numbers, like 2.5 million years ago and 12,000 years ago or something like this. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and so um, the, the story is that our ancestors were uh, had brains roughly like we do, and but they were using them on the plains of Africa to, to function in hunter-gatherer societies. They, they were not engaged in um, uh, high power uh, metaphysics uh, and they didn't need to do high power metaphysics to survive in the kind of environment they were in. Mm -hmm. And so the, um, wouldn't it be surprising, I thought, if evolution should have crafted in them faculties that were reliable with respect to these really recondite, um, uh, far removed from everyday reality kinds of questions. Um, um, and that that then uh, suggests the, the the question: How 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 likely is it that evolution did this? And and I thought, well, uh, it's either not very likely at all, um, or it's inscrutable. We just can't know how likely it is. And either way, you you you, you get a version of of the uh, evolutionary argument against naturalism up and running if you just have this weaker claim. And it, it, it I think this weaker claim is much much easier to defend than the stronger claim that Al's making about overall cognitive unreliability given evolution and naturalism. Yeah, oh, that's great. I, I I think you're right there, and it does remind me of again of of Lewis's miracles or maybe De Futilitate, a little essay that he wrote, where he 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 talks about this as well. He talks about the 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 grand myth uh, of of naturalism and how. What people usually say is, yeah, that they started out as really low form, uh, low resolution cognitive faculties that just through this process of evolution has sharpened and sharpened. And we kind of accidentally came to this point of being able to reason about mathematics and abstract objects. And it was just kind of the, the rising tide lifts all ships. And so I like that. I like that your argument is is easier to defend and it still targets those things because the whole conversation is a conversation in uh, abstract metaphysical uh, beliefs and and using our our cognitive faculties which produce those uh so tyler i'm interested again if you could just go over uh kind of repersonate that idea um of broadening it back out because i think tom's right that that this uh it's, it's easier to go in it's it's easier to defend but then if we can broaden that back out into the global idea the global skepticism that would be fantastic yeah so i think the the, the pushback about trying to apply it to all types of beliefs, right, is something like this. Um, that uh, beliefs that aid in survival and reproduction just will be true beliefs, right? Uh, because if, if you need to survive and say, get by getting water and drinking H2O, right, um, then you need to form the correct belief that water is that way. <laughs> and I need that water, right? And so the, the genius of Chris move is that uh, you can totally say, yep, that's right. Sure, I'll concede that. But you still have this problem with these complex abductive matters. Um, Planiga's kind of response to, to the sort of objection where it's like, yeah, true beliefs will just be, or beliefs that able survival and reproduction will just be true beliefs. Um, he has like this witch response mm -hmm. where it's like, you know, imagine everything is a witch. Like these people, they've evolved in such a way where they form beliefs that uh, this is a computer witch. This is a book witch, right? This is a stuffed animal witch. Um, you know, you, 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 everything's a witch. Well, if you form the belief that everything uh, possesses the property of, of being a witch, um, 
then you you can still form beliefs that aid in surviving reproduction, and yet those beliefs will be false. So, for example, when you form the belief that that tiger witch is coming to eat me, well, that's that's a false belief. It's not a tiger witch, right? But nonetheless, uh, it's going to get your body parts in the right place at the right time. So then you have this whole debate about whether or not um, we can uh, whether or not this is really a good solution to 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 the problem. And Chris's argument co- totally just kind of ignores all all of this literature, uh, and and I think hits hits to the hits to the heart of the matter. I think. Could, uh, Parker, could I just add a little bit to that because um, the the part about abduction, the way that it, uh, I wanted to uh, sort of follow up on on how that fits in. Um, the way that I was thinking of the the role of that in the argument was like this. So you ask the question: How how likely is it that our very distant evolutionary ancestors would have got cognitive faculties reliable with respect to abstruse metaphysics. Mm-hmm. And looks like uh, the right thing to think is, well, we don't know. I mean, it's it's inscrutable or 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 that, or it's low. I mean, it seems improbable in fact that they would have got faculties any good at that. And a response um, um, goes like this. Well, we have some reason to think that our evolutionary ancestors engaged in primitive forms of abduct, abductive reasoning. Uh, we know that from the study of uh, hunter-gatherer societies around, around now. Um, and um, so w- isn't it then not very surprising that 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 once our ancestors got a, a, a rudimentary ability to engage in abductive reasoning, that they should have just been able to redeploy that into other domains? Mm-hmm. Uh, so they, so it's in much the same way that once you learn the simple rules of arithmetic, you can redeploy it all over the place. You can uh, in, in 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 basically any domain. And so the thought is that maybe ab- abduction is like that. That if evolution produced very simple abductive abilities, then it's not at all surprising. In fact, is likely went, went the claim that um, we should be able to redeploy it in other domains, including these abstract domains studied in metaphysics. And so there, what I wanted to point out was, well, well, you can't. That's not. Uh, that move isn't obvious. The, even if it's so that our ancestors got a kind of rudimentary uh, abductive ability, um, th- and it's not obvious that it could be extensible into other domains. And and this has to do with the, the thing that Tyler was getting at, which is the, the way that the abduction works is it requires a kind of imaginative construction of hypotheses, which you then assess by a various selection principles, simplicity, explanatory power, and so forth. Um, but um, it, it, in order to uh, deploy our abductive uh, faculties in a domain, it has to be the case that our imaginative abilities are sufficiently robust um, so as to imagine uh, hypotheses that would be operative in these domains. Um, and um, even if it's so that our ancestors had abductive skills, w- w- what's the probability that those skills were such that they included imaginative powers uh, sufficient for uh, reliably deploying abduction in these abstract domains. And there I argue that, well, we don't know. I mean, uh, yeah. it's not just obvious that, that uh, it's not a priori obvious that they would have had the requisite imaginative power to redeploy abduction into these other domains. Um, maybe you can give an argument. Maybe there's some kind of argument that, in fact, they had the right kinds of uh, imaginative powers to redeploy abduction in, in these ways. The problem is the only kind of argument you're going to be able to give, it looks to me, is, is an abductive argument that that, that would be so. Yeah. And since, um, and, and moreover, it would be a an abductive argument that looks like it's trafficking in some pretty abstract metaphysics, yeah. postulating structures far removed from the everyday concerns of life and so forth. And so it's it's using the very faculty you're claiming is uh, to show the reliability of. Um, but that's not a very strong argument if you have to use ab- uh, uh, abstruse metaphysics to show that abstruse uh, metaphysical abilities are reliable, then you you don't have very strong arguments. So so that's how that all went. Yeah, I love that. Tyler, anything to add on that? No, no. It's a good argument. You should believe it. Yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> well, so I, but not I, if you're uh, a naturalist. That's right. That's right. So I think I think that uh, s- someone might be able to, uh, someone might want to counter and say, yeah, but if at this lower level uh, of sur- survivability, our, our uh, beliefs, our, our IBE, our inference of best explanation faculties 
our truth tracking because like Tyler said, we kind of, uh, we need to believe waters that way. Um, and so if they are truth tracking, then as we evolve up and they get sharper and sharper, there'll still be truth tracking onto even our metaphysical and abstract metaphysical uh, reasonings. But I think the whole point with the four F's is saying that they're, they're not directed at truth and you don't really have a reason to believe they're directed at truth because survival is easier. Survival beliefs are easier. If you can approximate the truth and get your body in position for the four F's, then it's much easier to survive thinking that two plus two equals 4.9. Uh, I mean, the, the right answer, there's one right answer. There's a billion wrong answers that get you close enough to survive. And I think that maybe that is where uh, it starts to come apart, the truth directedness versus belief directedness. And, and then when you when you get back up to the, the higher levels, you think, well, uh, our metaphysical beliefs don't really help us survive that much. Like it doesn't really matter. We're all here. We all have different metaphysical beliefs and yet we can all go find the yogurt in the fridge and it doesn't affect. I think that's, I don't know. Yeah. Any, any thoughts on, on what's doing the work here? The, the, the truth condition. I, I think that's where it, it starts to come back in that we need, we need our cognitive faculties aimed at, at truth. And again, I'm, I'm pulling back into proper function kind of stuff and sorry to keep fusing these two. And any thoughts on escaping the evolutionary argument there? I, I think the best way to escape the evolutionary argument against naturalism is to going back to Michael Bergman's uh, um, chapter in the evolutionary, the naturalism defeated volume, mm -hmm. um, where he basically says something like this, um, while it's true that the probability of um, having reliable faculties on naturalism and evolution is low, at least according to the propositional evidence, the non-propositional evidence could be such where the reliability is actually high, the probability of having reliable faculties is actually high. And so the non-propositional evidence is going to sort of triumph over the, the propositional evidence that's kind of in conflict with it. And so it's just kind of like a, a very readian response. Um, so, you know, imagine this, this is, this is probably how I'd characterize the, what, what's behind Bergman's um, response here. I would say, um, you know, imagine that uh, you hear that the probability of having reliable faculties on naturalism and evolution is low. Um, you hear the reasons why for thinking that, and you're like, oh, that's interesting. Okay. But then you start reflecting on it, and it seems like, no, due to your non propositional evidence, you're like, no, I'm sorry. My, the probability of my faculties being reliable is still actually really high. Um, I, I'm not going to be moved doxastically by this attempted defeater. In fact, um, my belief is going to deflect this attempted defeater. And so for proper functionalists, at least, the degree of warrant is determined in part by the firmness in which you hold to the, the belief in question. And so my the, I, let's say that I, I hold really firmly that my faculties are reliable and you know uh, so firmly that it's just it's it's not gonna it's gonna actually deflect the 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 uh, attempted defeater in question, and so I think this this kind of move is the best sort of move where uh, that that a naturalist can make. The problem with this sort of move is that um, I think this really only makes sense, at least having any sort of connection to truth, if you're a proper functionalist. Mm -hmm. And as mentioned earlier, I think that we have independent reason for thinking that proper functionalism requires theism. Yeah. And so you, in order to avoid the, the non-propositional move, um, you're going to have to endorse, uh, uh, so, sorry, in, in order to um, endorse this non-propositional move by, by Bergman, uh, you're going to end up having to endorse proper functionalism. And in order to endorse proper functionalism, you're going to have to endorse theism. So it's not going to really help the naturalists, I think. That's fantastic. Yeah. Can, can I come, please? Can I come? Um, yeah. So that paper by Bergman is terrific because it it um, at the heart of it is an intuition that has been deployed 
and various thought experiments by planning in different contexts. So, so he says, uh, imagine that you clearly remember uh, spending all day yesterday in your office working and somebody presents you very powerful propositional evidence that in fact you're in Arizona robbing a bank. Um, it might be, you, you know, that you're not, you, you might have to admit that that the, the probability that you were in your office in California working all day yesterday, given all the propositional evidence that's been presented to you, is low or inscrutable. You're, you're not quite sure what to make of this propositional evidence, but you very clearly remember <laughs> being in your office and have no reason for thinking that your faculties are massively malfunctioning. And and so this clear uh, memorial belief function as as a kind of defeater defeater. Uh, 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 this uh, and it's 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 not propositional evidence that's it's doing the defeating. It's just this clear memory, this clear memorial belief in the phenomenology that goes with it. And you you might have something like that with respect to belief in the reliability of your own faculties. You, you might have this very powerful belief that your faculties are reliable. Uh, Tyler, I, I wondered I wonder what you think about this though as a as a uh, uh, response to the to the kind of objection you're raising to this Reedian um, strategy. What, what if you thought, what if you were in, uh, some kind of um, uh, evidentialist and you thought that there was this phenomenal, phenomenology of seeming um, that, that, could, that could have justificatory uh, power? So then if you have a really powerful seeming that your faculties are reliable, maybe that could function as greedy and evidence uh, for the reliability of your faculties um, that wouldn't require the proper functionalist kind of um, right, framework. right. So if if we're talking about warrant, though, seemings I don't think are connected enough to truth to sort of secure a tight connection to truth. And so uh, we're going to have to connect the seeming somehow, either through a, a reliable process, right? If you're uh, maybe a process reliableist or... And, and so this is where I think you're going to end up getting into like the... Um, the epistem epistemology debate about epistemic theories because if, if you're going to find uh if you're going to find not satisfactory just to simply say uh seemings is sufficient for warrant right i don't know of anyone who who, who would say that seemings is sufficient for warrant because generally it's a it's an epistemic theory about justification right so um if we're talking about warrant here um then, then you're going to have to tie seemings to some some reliable process or some properly functioning process and uh, that's where I guess you would do the epistemology battle, battle royale. And um, if, if you come away with thinking that proper, you need proper function, that proper function is the correct theory of warrant, uh, then, then, th then that's when the implication is going to follow. Yeah, yeah. No, that seems right. Then you'll have a, it'll, it'll devolve into a debate about fundamental epistemology. Um, the second question I had for you, Tyler, about this was, um, I thought that the best response to this reading objection to the to the narrower version of the argument that you and I have defended the the, the so the, the one according to which it's the reliability of our uh, metaphysical faculties that's inscrutable or low um, the, the, the one the, the reading response there would be something like um, well when I consider the reliability of my metaphysical faculties, I find it just obvious that they're reliable. Um, or I, when I consider the possibility that that they're not reliable, I get this emotion of ridicule, and that and that's what then is functioning as a as a defeater um, uh, for any argument you you put to me that my that, that I should doubt the the reliability of my faculties. And what I wanted to say in response was, I, I myself don't find that seeming. Uh, uh, it's not just obvious to me that my metaphysical faculties are thus reliable. Um, if you look at the history of philosophy, there's a you know, massive disagreement about these questions of abstract metaphysics. Um, it, it isn't just a priori obvious at all that my metaphysical faculties are reliable. And so uh, I'm a little suspicious of someone who comes to me and says that they're having uh, this uh, <laughs> experience of, of obviousness about, about that proposition. What do you think? Yeah, yeah. So I think that's one strategy, right? You can you can decrease the firmness of, of the belief in question, right? You can uh, weaken the seeming uh, by way of showing, hey, look at all these instances where we thought we had it right, we thought we were doing good metaphysics, and it, we we were completely, uh, com completely, f you know, it could be further from the truth here. Um, mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I think I think that that might be able to decrease the confidence level, decrease the firmness of, of holding to the belief in question and therefore make it more susceptible to the defeater. I think that seems right. 
Yeah, we we just had to bring up like uh, Thomistic metaphysics or something as a. As a... <laughs> uh, uh, uh. He, he's saying this because I'm Catholic. So. Uh, okay. Okay. Yeah, well, I had to. I had to. <laughs> uh, Tom, unless there's anything else, I, I would love I would love to present a, a unique case of of uh, Ian to you guys and just get your thoughts on it. Um, is that cool? Can we go there? Okay, so so um, I, I got this from James Anderson. He wrote a blog post about the simulation hypothesis, and he, tr he tries to apply a um, self-defeating argument. Um, so uh, the simulation hypothesis, for those who aren't familiar, it's another family. I've learned that, right? But there's a Bostromian uh, view where uh, Nick Bostrom puts forward this idea, this argument that uh, either we will um, never get to the point of, sim of the, the simulation point. We'll never be able to make conscious... Uh, simulated beings, or two, we don't do so for moral reasons. Um, maybe everyone in humanity says it's immoral to make conscious beings just for our pleasure or whatever, so we don't do it. Or three, we're most likely, or we're, yeah, we're most likely living in a simulation already. And he says, you know, just take your empirical evidence that you have now, you know, look at look at the past 50 years and how we've changed uh, all of our, our equipment, everything. We've It's boomed. It's crazy. Just give another 50 years. Give 100 years. And it's plausible that we could come to this simulation point where we make conscious beings. And if that's the case, we're probably already living in one. So Anderson says, well, it's, a, it's like a Wittgensteinian, you know, kick the ladder away. You've asked me to rely on my empirical uh, knowledge. And then at the end, you've said all my empirical knowledge is false because I'm living in a computer simulation. So it, he, he tries to develop the self-defeat there. What I've tried to do is then take that in, in more of an Ian kind of way and say, whatever simulation we're living in, uh, if it's one that you, it, that the three of us can be deceived about, if we can come to believe that we live in a computer simulation, it has to be a simulation where, um, where so it has to be one where we come to know it because the three of us, I mean, I don't have any seemings that I live in a computer simulation. I don't think that, I don't, I don't it wasn't written on the moon or anything. So I wanted to kind of follow the witch, the witch argument type thing. So. All of my beliefs are directed at telling me I live in base reality. You know, I, I, I think that I'm living in the real world, the base reality, but really I'm living in a computer simulation. Now, I think if you come to believe that idea, then your cognitive faculties are not aimed at truth, but it's aimed at this falsity that you live in base reality when in actuality I live in a simulated world. And so then I think that that truth condition is not there. It's a, a simulation condition it's aimed at. Uh, and that's a lie. And so it's a falsity. Therefore, all of my beliefs are aimed, ha have been produced by cognitive faculties that are aimed at falsehood, not truth. And therefore, I have a reason to doubt that I live in a computer simulation. And I, I want to draw out some self-defeat. I just wanted to get your guys' thoughts on that. Um, do you think that we could come to know that we live in a computer simulation uh, if all of our faculties are, are th thus far have told us that we live in base reality? Uh, does it make sense at all? You guys catching it? I can explain more, I guess, if, if we need to. Um, Parker, uh, it does make sense. Uh, I, I thought you were going to go a different direction and and suggest a kind of uh, uh, debunking argument uh, um, f for some kind of skepticism, mm -hmm. uh, w w which would be something like, uh, what you know, what's the probability that we're that we're in a um, uh, a simulation, given our our total background evidence, and you might think, well, it's inscrutable because um, things would look just as they do to us if if, if we were in, in a simulation. And 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 if that's so, then you might think by a kind of Ian like argument that we get reason for uh, doubting the reliability of our of our faculties. Mm -hmm. uh, and since you might think uh, among the deliverances of our faculties is is uh, Christian theism, uh, maybe then you get a, an Ian-like argument uh, mm -hmm. uh, suggesting a defeater for theism or something like that. So, so, but that 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 strikes me as an interesting uh, argument uh, 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 redeploying Ian in in uh, these other contexts. Is, is that in the neighborhood of what of what you're thinking, or you're or you're you're not exactly well, wondering that? So, uh, in, insofar as producing a defeater for Christian theism, um, that is what I counter. So I'm a, I'm a, a campus minister. I work with Athletes in Action. And so I'm sharing, sharing the gospel on campus, you know, uh, discipling uh, wrestlers and other uh, athletes. 
and this comes up all the time because everyone listens to Joe Rogan and Joe Rogan has Joe, every other guest talks about uh, the simulation hypothesis. So people will, will toss that out as kind of a smoke screen or a defeater and say, well, isn't it possible we're living in a computer simulation? Mm -hmm. And so I want to develop an argument and I, I, I've tried to, uh, that, that says that the, that idea, if you come to believe that, then you have a reason to doubt your cognitive faculties because they haven't been aimed at truth. They've been designed by a, I mean, it doesn't have to be an evil uh, simulator, but whatever the case is, the simulator designed you to think that you live in base reality. And whatever reasons they have for doing that, maybe they're studying you, maybe they're studying people, uh, Elon Musk will say stuff like this, where they say, you know, the, the 2016 election is obviously evidence that we live in a computer simulation because Trump wasn't supposed to win, but the simulator said, let's see what happens if Trump wins in 2016. Now this chaos happens. So people will use that 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 kind of view to say we there's providence. They kind of hold to like a providence view, but it can't be God. It's a simulator. Mm -hmm. And so I just think if, if you do come to believe that you live not in base reality, but in a simulated world, then you have a defeater for your cognitive faculties because they're not aimed at truth. So that's kind of what I'm getting at. And I see. I see. yeah, Tyler, well, any, any thoughts I, on I wonder if two things. One, I wonder if you can tell a story that's like uh, analogous to like the Holy Spirit coming and, and repairing our faculty, or repairing our, our uh, census divinitatis. Yeah. Maybe like the simulators can come and start repairing our faculties. Yeah. <laughs> um, or in, in some way, because we're simulations, we're computers, we're right. programs, right? So mm -hmm. you can do that sort of thing. And, and secondly, uh, I guess just immediately, um, having not given much thought about this, yeah, uh, <laughs> um, it seems absolutely possible that there could still be some processes, some cognitive systems that uh, still are functioning properly and aimed at truth. Maybe some aren't, um, but maybe some are, and maybe it's those faculties that are functioning properly that um, are able to uh, to achieve knowledge about that we're in a computer simulation or something like that. Well, so, so those are my two quick thoughts. Yeah, no, those are great. And those are great thoughts. And the second thought reminds me back to, to Tom's argument that, um, yeah, so maybe maybe our a priori knowledge uh, is, is left unscathed. Uh, we could go into, you know, the impossibility of strong artificial intelligence or something like that from Searle's argument. But sticking with this one, uh, if, okay, so maybe our a priori beliefs, but I, I, whatever the case, our abstract metaphysical beliefs are not in that protected class of a priori beliefs. I don't, I don't think maybe they would be, but I'm wondering if we could um, employ Tom's argument and just uh, limit it to abstract metaphysical beliefs, which of which the simulation hypothesis is one. So, yeah, the, the 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 limited version to to target metaphysical beliefs, and the simulation hypothesis is a metaphysical belief. So, if you come to realize that you live in a computer simulation and your your cognitive faculties are aimed at making you think you don't live in base reality, uh, they've been designed that way. So now you're coming to this belief that even though your cognitive faculties have been designed to tell you a lie or to make you believe a lie. Now you believe the truth. This one's true. This one belief about simulation hypothesis is not affected by the be aiming at a falsity. Parker, what, what, what about this as a variation of what you just suggested? Yeah. So, so um, suppose we live in a um, simulation, um, but we, we, don't, we don't know anything about the designers of the simulation mm -hmm. and their intentions. Do they intend to design us with faculties that are overall reliable? Do they intend to design us with faculties that are reliable with respect to metaphysics? We have no idea. Yeah. Um, and that gives us the inscrutability, uh, the, the relevant inscrutability then. Uh, what's the probability that our, let's stick with our metaphysical faculties, our metaphysical faculties are reliable given the simulation story um, we don't know. It's inscrutable. And and that, and then that's enough yeah. to get us a defeater for any deliverance of our metaphysical faculties, including belief in a simulation. Because they're un inscrutable, uh, we can't decide whether they're uh, truth tracking or whether they're generally reliable or not. That's good. Okay. I like that one. Yeah. No, I know that reminds me, um, you know, Eric Baldwin and I, we, ha we talk about the sort of the preconditions needed to make sense of um, being able to 
tell the Plantingian Reformed epistemology story for a particular world religions, right? And with Islam, we talk about, uh, you know, God, he deceives, uh, I believe it's Surah 8, he deceives Muhammad and his army for good reason, not for malicious reason, but for, you know, for, for good reason. Um, there's some counterfactual stuff in there, actually. Molinists will, will appreciate Surah 8. Um, and, you know, elsewhere in the Quran, it's, God says he's the best deceiver, right? Um, no, no, no one, one basically out deceives better than, than, than him. Um, and uh, we talk about this. We, we talk about um, sort, sort of an, a, a, a scenario. Imagine that you're with, with a military brigade or something. You're, you're, you're a unit and your captain realizes that you have to form false beliefs that reinforcements are coming in order for y'all to even have a chance because you, you'll have more courage and be more bold and be able to fight better. So he has this nefarious technology. He has this laser gun where he shoots it. He shoots you with it and you form the false belief that reinforcements are coming. And so then you, you, you actually go on to win the battle. And afterwards you're like, well, the reinforcements never came. And he's like, ah, I shot you with this gun. But for a good reason. If I didn't shoot it, shoot you with it, we, we, we'd be done for. And um, uh, but nonetheless, let's say like later on, and, and you you meet him in the lobby, and you hear him boasting to other people that he's the best with this gun. That um, he 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 does really good deceptions with this gun, right? No no one out deceives him. Uh, then you might start worrying, like, well, hey. Um, how many how many times has he shot me with that gun? Maybe he's shooting me with the gun right now. Ah, right, <laughs> Just your head explodes out of uh, existential angst. Um, and so, you know, we talk about one of the conditions is that uh, not only are you gonna have to have a designer, but the designer is gonna have to be good and intend for you to produce true beliefs. And so it seems like in this condition, like what Tom was saying, you're not meeting this condition. It seems like that that this condition is not met, so you you couldn't. Um, you, you'd have a defeater, it seems to me, like agreeing with Tom. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Tom, anything to add on that? No, I mean, it, it, it does seem like once you sort of um, are, are see the move here, see, see how this, the, the, the logic of this argument, it does look like there are pretty narrow constraints under which you can avoid skepticism, uh, met, either metaphysical skepticism or more global skepticism. Yeah. And you, you, you do need some reason for thinking, some, some uh, either a priori or, or uh, epistemically basic reason for thinking your faculty is the product of something or someone that wanted you to have faculties that are truth aimed and, and are reliable. Yeah. Um, and theism get, gives you that. Uh, well, not just any version of theism, as you're suggesting, Tyler. Christian theism gives you that. Um, but um, uh, not very many other worldviews do, and that's interesting. Yeah. So, so just a, a quick follow up, maybe to make it more concrete. Uh, uh, you guys seen The Matrix before? Many, many times. Okay. Awesome. Yes. Okay. Great. So, this is a point that was brought up by Ben Shapiro, of, of all people. He just randomly was talking about The Matrix, and he's like, you know, the the problem with The Matrix is the writers never address the question, is he still in the matrix? Is he one level up in the matrix? <laughs> yeah. and, and, you know, they, they're pulling from Philip K. Dick and Philip K. Dick was a master at this. He would always leave you in the kind of, where am I kind of thing, but they, they just didn't follow that thread in the second movie. They did a little bit. He stops a squiddy, you know, uh, in, in the base reality. But in, in my mind, I thought about that more and I thought, could, could Neo ever be justified or warranted? However, we're parsing that in any of his beliefs ever again once he come once he came to realize he was living in a matrix all his beliefs were directed at at a lie this whole world that he lived in was a lie all of his belief producing uh all of his beliefs were false so then he comes to this new world and he just now i'm i'm here and i can trust morpheus but why doesn't what why doesn't he think he's in a nested uh simulation or you know can he be justified ever again yeah tyler well it's, it, it seems like if he reflects on the situation, he's like, oh, yeah, I was deceived. Uh, now I'm not finding myself believing that I'm deceived. It seems like I'm not being deceived anymore. And uh, he, 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 that, that belief is, is held too firmly, even in light of past deception. 
and this belief is the product of proper function conditions being in place, then it seems like he could know. It seems like he, he doesn't have to, it seems like this, like a hard internalist requirement to be able to mm. say that you have to be able to always constantly prove that you're not being deceived, something like that. So it seems like some Cartesian sort of. Well, and, and that's kind of what I had in mind, Car uh, Descartes, you know, dream argument. But this is a case of you've been deceived, you've been globally deceived in the past. And now you just, you, you thought you were justified there. You thought you, were, you had warrant for your beliefs. But then you came to realize that all your beliefs were unwarranted or unjustified. But now you've woken up from that. But what's the relevant, like, dissimilarity between the two worlds? One kind of like ghetto looking, it's all jacked up. So maybe that's more believable. But um, yeah, I'm just not familiar enough with like the internal. So, so maybe, maybe Tom has a different sort of approach to this, but my approach is just that if you reflect on the attempted defeater and it does nothing for you ah. and you keep believing and you, you keep believing is the result of proper function conditions being in place, mm -hmm. that's, that's the, that, that, that's sufficient for warrant. Okay. Um, but perhaps Tom has a, a different approach or wants to add a, a different spin on this. Mm -mm. No, I, I would think of it the same way. So, so yeah, if, if Neo is, uh, inclined to accept the testimony of people around him after having been awakened. Uh, he finds plausible the story he's been told about all, all that's happened. Uh, and his faculties are functioning properly, um, then he's um, he's doing fine epistemically. He's, he's, he's got no no reason to become a skeptic or or to doubt the de deliverances of his of his faculties. This is now, good. he may not have a good argument. It, it is worth pointing right. out. He may not have a good argument that he's uh, not still in a higher level matrix, mm -hmm. but um, but the the lesson of 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 reading and epistemology, the lesson of proper functionalist epistemology, is you don't need a good argument to be warranted in believing that things are basically as they seem to you, um, so long as the your belief that things are that way is the product of properly functioning faculties, um, yeah. then all's well. And, That's good. and this is this is what I was trying to say earlier, uh, perhaps poorly, as a naturalist response to the evolutionary argument against naturalism is just that like, oh, I've reflected on the defeater. I, I see what you're saying there, but I'm unmoved by it. I'm just going to keep believing that my faculties are reliable. And then, as I pointed out, I don't think this move is ultimately going to be able to be plausible unless you invoke proper function. And that's obviously requires theism, I think, at least on my view. Um, so yeah, that that's kind of the the, the parody from earlier as well, kind of tying everything in together. Yeah, hmm. no, that's great. You guys did a great job on that one. Uh, I took us far afield, but we we got back, and this has actually really helped clarify internalist and externalist conditions for me. And now I got to retool this argument and think through. But this is helpful. This is really great. Um, I appreciate but Parker. It. Yeah, I, I mean, I just want to say, I think there really is a, a powerful argument here that you, that you're in in the nearby woods of. Uh, against the um, uh, rationality of belief in a simulation hypothesis. Mm. It, it looks to me that there's an Ean style argument awesome. against the rationality of belief that we're in a simulation. And that's a pretty interesting result, one yeah. that I hadn't thought about before. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, it takes, it takes, it probably uh, takes being a millennial and talking with Gen Zers uh, all day, every day about all crazy stuff and, <laughs> and seeing their memes. Tyler, you know all about memes and stuff too, yeah. <laughs> Um, well, uh, we could talk about this more and, and Lord willing, we will. I'd love to talk to both you guys again, individually together, metaphysics, epistemology, all that good stuff. Hopefully I can entice both of you, uh, to come back individually or together. We'll see. Uh, but for now that's going to have to do it. Uh, uh, Tom, where, where can people find you? Actually, it's kind of hard to find you. <laughs> find you if they want to read more of your stuff, hear your lectures, something like that. Um, yeah, I have a website, Thomas M. Crisp. Dot com. You can find my stuff there. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. Tyler, how about yourself? Uh, TylerMcNab.com. And uh, obviously, you could find me on Twitter, Facebook as well. And feel free to add me and ask questions. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, you can find me at ParkerSetaCase.com. So there's a, a theme, uh, which is awesome. Uh, appreciate you guys so much. This has been really fun. And thanks for letting me, thanks for indulging me with simulation kind of stuff. I know our, our audience is going to love it. We talk about it all the time. Um, that's going to have to do it. This has been Parker's Pensies. And as always, all glory to God. <laughs>